I'm going to show you something about America that I think is going to blow your mind. And I think this is irrefutable evidence in creating the timeline. And I think it might actually disrupt a lot of our pre-existing ideas about when things may have happened. Before I do that, let me give you a little tiny refresher by showing you the statues of America from the lands between. We know these very well. She has two braids, one of which is much longer than the other, and now we know the reason why, and that's because she gave it as an offering to the grandmother at Shaman Village. She has two armbands. She's in this hanging sacrificial pose. We're very familiar with this image. Now the statues of America in the Realm of Shadow are somewhat stylized the same, arms still outstretched, but palms are facing upward this time. She has a braided belt. She's not wearing this belt in the statues in the lands between. And she has two braids. And these braids seem to be about the same length. And if we can assume that these statues of America were constructed and sculpted following her appearance at the time of when they were erected, that now gives us a good idea about what may have been going on at the time of whatever construction these statues are located in. So this is America much later in her life, and this is America earlier. She doesn't have the armbands, her outfit is different, her hair is shorter. Now there's one more statue of America that we see, and that is the statue of America in Mesmer's Dark Chamber. And as I was playing around with reshader and the mods and trying to find out how to increase the brightness, I actually, I actually toggled a mod that lets you see like the rough polygons of the structure. And I was actually shocked to see that this braid is much longer than the standard length of the statue of America in the Realm of Shadow. So now we have three different versions of America. We have three different hair lengths and this statue having one armband, only on one arm, but not the other. This now is another signifier of the in-between time. And now we can link this time period to Mesmer. Now I'm not sure the significance of the armband. I'm, I'm wondering if it's some sort of marital status that it signifies she's married or signifies maybe an important win in her campaign, an important milestone. And now she has two in the lands between. But the fact that Merica is missing half a braid when she is holding baby Mesmer makes me wonder if this now corresponds to what happened there, either before his birth or corresponding with she made the sacrifice to the grandmother. And by the way, this serene, beautiful look of her holding this baby, we don't see some warlord, bloodthirsty queen. We see a mother holding a baby. But considering her braid is missing, this makes me think that Mesmer may have even been conceived out of the revelation of what happened at Shaman Village. This, to me, puts it around the same time period. And if we are going off the length of the braids as time having passed, this now means to me that America's conquest in the outer lands between, that may have possibly happened much later than what we're seeing here. If we, if we can assume that at the time these statues were constructed, that they would reflect the way that Merica currently looked, then we could assume, okay, at this time, Merica's hair was much longer, much time has passed. This now, to me, shakes up the timeline in a way that I'm not sure I can reconcile. I'm still thinking through that. But there's one other thing on this statue that I think is a huge clue about her background, and that is the braided belt. So the braided belt we don't see in... The lands between, it's gone. It's cast off. And this brings me to my first point, which is the, the braids. Now, I just did a video about braids, and you all were so insightful in the comment section, adding your ideas and opinions about why braids were so important to the horn scent. And it really helped tie everything together, that the horn scent viewed the braid as a symbol of divinity or worship. It was a sacred symbol. The spiral, the helix, it's all over horn scent culture. It's in their incantations, it's in their structures, their towers, their pillars, their curtains, their paraphernalia. 
the tablets showing a spiral tree. It's in their incense burners. The spiral was a sacred symbol to them. The braid was a symbol of divinity. It, it was important to them. Merica having a braided belt, Merica having braids in her hair, shows me that she must have been, she must have had ties to the horn scent in a way. Now we know Merica isn't horn scent. We know that she's from Shaman Village. So what could this possibly mean? Why does Merica have the divine braid? Why is she wearing a braided cord around her waist? I think that Merica was the jar saint that they were trying to create. The horn scent being obsessed with the spiral and the braid and the way that the crucible blended life together in a haphazard way in this primordial soup where everything expressed characteristics of things that it shouldn't. Turtles having horns. Creatures having feathers where there ought to be fur or skin. The horn scent were trying to blend life together and play God. They were playing with the cycle of life and death themselves. They were mere mortals trying to create their God. And this is a flip on the trope of a God creating men. They were men creating a God. And I think Merica was their God. In Bellarat Tower Jail, there is a altar for a great jar. And on the podium of that altar is a Lemniscate symbol, the infinity symbol. Within this symbol, you see a man, a human, you see a bird. You also see what appear to be two beasts, maybe foxes or cats. You see all of these creatures within the confines of this infinity symbol, which is in itself made out of what appears to be a branch. And it's woven. You see even the spiral braided pattern right there again. And I think this is essentially what the jars were. It was a combination of man, bird, beast, giant hippo salamander. I think that the horn scent probably had a perverted sense of the idea of if I fits, I sits. They, they probably thought if they could chop it up, they could put it in a jar. And I think they experimented and experimented and experimented until the sewers ran red with the blood of their victims. And then they found out the shaman made wonderful additions to their recipe because the shaman made everything in the jar blend together well. He made it stick. And that was Merga's people. They were the final missing ingredient. They were that close to figuring out, okay, how do we create the ideal life? And then they found their missing component. And that was an Empyrean. They needed an Empyrean shaman to blend it all together and make it one successful product. And I think that's why Merica was the only successful saint that arose from this jar practice. And now this brings me to the horn scent grandam that we see in Bellarat Tower Settlement. She has dialogue that is somewhat locked. Well, it's not locked, but it's hidden. You might not necessarily know to do it. After you beat the Divine Beast, if you wear its head and you go speak to her, she then has dialogue about Mesmer and his lineage and the wanton strumpet. And her name changes. She's now called the Empyrean Grandam. And Grandam is an archaic term for grandmother or old woman, female ancestor. And the fact that she's called Empyrean Grandam, we can now maybe see this in a different number of ways. She was a grandmother to an Empyrean. She was an elderly Empyrean herself. She was an ancestor to an Empyrean, or she was maybe the grandmother type figure for an Empyrean. And the only Empyrean that we know confirmed to be in this area is Merica. The only Empyrean that she references is Merica. That strumpet. By the way, her calling Merica a wanton strumpet. So <laughs> wanton is already sort of, I guess, maybe used in a derogatory way for this like loose woman. So is Strumpet. So her doubling down in that way, calling Merica a wanton Strumpet, is like calling her a slutty slut. This is such a charged and personal insult. And there's something there. She's not calling her. She's calling her what she thinks Merica has done. So this Empyrean Grandam, I believe, may have been the figure that raised Merica once she was taken out of the jar, once she had 
finalized. Once they figured out, okay, she's the one, it worked this time. And that's why she's the Empyrean Grandam. Because Empyrean isn't a term that is thrown around loosely. We can count the Empyreans that we know for certain on one hand. Merica, the Glomide Queen, Mikola, Melania, and Rani. Empyreans are rare. And then on top of that, you have Merica being a shaman. That would have been such a rarity. And I think that it's possible that they may have even known this. They may have even noticed there was something different about this little shaman girl. Because we find out through Ansbach that Empyrean eyes are different. When Mikola divests his eye, when he leaves it behind, Ansbach has some dialogue about that. He says, Tender Mikola's eye is no mere morsel of flesh. It is a vessel of soaring grace. Proof of his Empyrean lineage. We know that there's something peculiar about an Empyrean eyes. To the point where Ansbach said, "There's, it's not just an eye. There's something unique in the Empyrean eye that stood out. And I think that the Empyrean eye might have actually been a portal <laughs> for the fingers to look through. During the meteor, Mother of Fingers fight, you see a tiny, tiny little red dot. You see what I think to be a singular eye. And I think that eye may have been the method by which they looked through the Empyrean eye. This was a connection. This was like the spy cam that the fingers would use to look through the Empyrean eye. And that's why it's different. It's no mere morsel of flesh. It's proof of their Empyrean lineage, proof that they've been selected by the fingers. I think that Merica stood out because of her eye. She was selected. And the Grand M. Empyrean was the one chosen to raise her in the Hornscent culture. And we know that Hornscent didn't value traits like empathy and hesitation. They didn't value kindness. They didn't value things that they viewed to be weaknesses in the way of what they felt needed to be done. Oh, we don't have time to hesitate about killing people. We just have to do it. To hesitate, to second guess, that's a wickedness. And I think Merica was raised in the Hornsent culture to adopt these values. And that is why we see Merica with her braids, the divine spiral, the divine braid. We see her with a braided belt, and that links her back to the Hornsent. I also think that the Hornsent may have chopped up a snake and they also put it in jars. Because if you go to Bonnie Village, there is a snake skin there. Now, it doesn't look chopped up, but it looks shedded. And I'm wondering if this snake skin is here to signify the snake got put into a jar, possibly the same jar with Merica. Maybe Merica shared a jar with a lump of this snake. This snake skin actually looks exactly like the one in the Temple of Egle. And so I'm not sure if it's supposed to be the same snake, but I think it's very possible that Merica definitely had aspects of the serpent inside her. And that's when we see Mesmer being born, the snake that writhed within Mesmer. And so now if we go back to that statue of her holding baby Mesmer, he doesn't look like a snake. He just looks like a baby. But I think that America, when she cut off this braid of her hair, this may have been around the same time that she figured out or she learned what happened to her people. And I think she may have wanted to start getting rid of these aspects that were inside of her, that were a part of her without her consent. And she took that snake aspect and she put it into baby Mesmer. And then she plucked out his eye and sealed it so it, it couldn't come out. And I think that's a very real possibility of what happened here. I think Merica probably desperately loved him but she couldn't have this aspect inside of her and this, this living thing that she had to shed. She, she put in a baby and she hid it. She loved him, but no one can know about you. No one can know what I am. <laughs> I'm not sure if that may be accurate, but I think it's a really good explanation as to why America at this point now, we see her one armband, 
one braid is longer, one braid is missing, and she's holding baby Mesmer. I think that all really blends that together very well. We also learned that Melania was Mesmer's younger sister, and America could have done the same to her. She sealed an aspect of herself that she didn't like in Melania. And that is how she got rid of things, is by pushing them into another being, a vessel to hold this living thing that was a part of her, that was blended with her in the jar when she was created as a saint. Now, the dark chamber in which you find Mesmer is attached to the storeroom, and this is a museum. It's a, a library of vast proportions, several stories tall, of records and tablets and histories and tales. You even see in Merica's bedroom chamber, tablets and tablets, histories. I think that Merica was very curious about the history of the lands between. I think she was very curious about where she may have came from. And I think that Merica may have learned about what happened to her in the storeroom by going through all of these records. It's attached to this area where Mesmer lived. It's attached to this area where she hid Mesmer. And I wonder if she found out about what happened to her and Mesmer was a product of that revelation, of that anger and hatred she felt. That it was, it was manifested in this way. And she wanted to get rid of it. And so she put it into Mesmer. And that's why he, he isn't able to escape that hatred. Is because it's the very concept that was put into him. And Mesmer's chamber being attached to the storeroom kind of made me think that this is where all of this may have gone down. This is where America may have found out the truth about her life. I think that Merica may have actually had a Sephiroth moment in the storeroom. And if you've played Final Fantasy VII, you know what I'm talking about. But if you haven't, Sephiroth is the main antagonist of this game. He is a perfect creation. Long, flowing, beautiful hair. He is the ideal specimen that was created from an ancient race of beings that no longer exist. And the DNA from one surviving being was taken. Her name was Genova. And Genova has been kept alive in this state against her will. And her DNA has been used to create a class of super soldiers by a military corporation named Shinra. But Sephiroth doesn't know this. Sephiroth is just an upstanding, respectable tool of Shinra. He's their ideal soldier. He's their poster boy. And he's very proud to be so. But one night when he's stationed away in another town. He has access to the company records and he starts delving into them and he finds out the truth about how he came to be. He found out about Genova and about where he came from, about all of the awful experiments that Shinra was conducting, all these mutations, the torture of people and creatures that they were doing for years trying to create their ideal specimen and he locks himself away for days, reading everything, absorbing it all, learning the history that's been concealed from him from his whole life. And then he snaps. He becomes enraged at learning about the truth of how he was created and what was done to the ancients and what was done to his mother, Genova. And he burns the entire town down. And then from that point out, he sets out to bring revenge against the entire planet for what was done to his people. Is this sounding familiar to you? Genova actually kind of looks like America at the end of the game as well, the disembodied torso that's just being suspended. But this whole storyline of Sephiroth reading all these records and entries and then just burning it all down, that's what I'm envisioning might have happened to America. I think she, she, I think she learned about how she came to be much later on after her existence, after she had already been working for the Hornscent, after she had completed assignments for them and whatnot. At the bottom of the storehouse is a hospital wing for the jars, and this basement is littered with them. Perfume bottles hang all over, and lifeless jar innards lay in beds. Merica was no doubt trying to save her people through these hopeless operations. And this is such a heartbreaking and incredibly tragic scene. The desperation in trying to piece together the shaman 
but as you can see, it was an impossible feat. And so this wing has been left abandoned. But we see the actions of a woman who has been heartbroken and hurt. We see her empathy, her pain, her love. And I think that when she saw that this wasn't going to work, that might have been when she became determined to then exterminate the horn scent. If she couldn't bring her people back, then she would wipe out those that took them away. And this is why I think that Mesmer being conceived shortly after America makes this discovery and cuts off her braid. I think it fits together so well because he was meant to be a symbol of fear. That was his appointment by his mother. But she plotted, she bided her time, she may have not even been strong enough, she may have not even had the allies to do so at this point. But I think this was when that plan may have went into effect. And that is the betrayal that the Empyrean Hornscent Grandam is talking about, America. How could their perfect creation, how could their, their saint, their perfect spiral, braided together from so many strands of life, who defeated their enemies, who fought for them. How could she do this to them? The greater potentate Hornsent that we meet also mentions the betrayal of his people by America. But for there to be betrayal, there has to have first been trust, or a promise or a vow. Something had to have been broken there. I think another scenario where betrayal might be an option is if America somehow betrayed another Empyrean that we don't directly see mentioned in the DLC, but the Glomide Queen. It was speculated that this scene in the story trailer had something to do with her, and my brilliant friend Kate, we've done a couple of Lore Maiden streams together, she had a really amazing theory to share when the story trailer first dropped, and I still think that it's a really awesome idea. And she proposed that Radigan may have been used to seduce the Glomide Queen, and then she was slain and her body was used for America's ascension through the Divine Gate. And the sky that we see here above the Divine Gate is Gloam. Gloam is a time of day. It's just after sunset, twilight. And so the Gloam-eyed Queen, and we see the sunset sky, but present-day Ener Elam, twilight doesn't exist. It's as if night itself was killed. So Gloam doesn't exist here anymore, and I think... That's really significant. Now, after I've pointed out these things to you about Merica's statues, let's take a look at Radigan's statue because we see some of the same themes here. We see Radigan. He has one long single braid. He also has a braided cord around his belt. And he also has two armbands. And I think the reason that I'm leaning towards this idea that the armbands mean or signify marriage is that both Merica and Radigan have two armbands. And at this point in time, they would have each been married twice. Merica married to Godfrey and then Radigan, and then Radigan married to Renala and then Merica. That's sort of why I drew the conclusion that the armbands might signify marriage. And so this statue of Merica holding baby Mesmer, only having one armband, to me at that time, I would think, okay, well, maybe Merica would have been wed to Godfrey at that time. I also find it interesting that the statues of Radigan have him at the base of a tree, like he's coming out of these tree branches, and Merica, her statues, all have the same exact swirl behind them. And I think that the difference here shows that they were two different types of entity that were merged together. And that might also be a hint about what's going on with the shadow tree here as well, because it sort of looks like you have the same kind of spiral clasp <laughs> joining it together. I think that this statue we see in Ener Elam, of these two figures together, of this entwining rope, this entwining structure around them, blending them together, I think this is signifying the creation of America. This is the romanticized version of the jar worship. This is what they thought it was. This, oh, look how beautiful the blending of life is. Look how beautiful the spiral braiding people together is. When in reality, we know what it looked like. 
We know it was violent and it was gruesome and it was nothing like what they presented it to be. Merica may have even been told that she was born of a beautiful spiral, a beautiful blending. And she didn't find out the truth about what really happened. She didn't find out about what, what actually went into her creation until later. And she may have been disgusted and started planning to divest herself of these things that were inside of her, that were blended with her. Because I don't think Merica, I don't think she was a bloodthirsty, hungry, cruel queen. I don't think she was mean and I don't think she had these qualities within her naturally. We know she didn't. When you go to Shaman Village and you find the minor herd tree there, it says that it was the secret incantation of Queen America, only the kindness of gold without order. And the song here, the harp, the isolated harp from the theme song we know so well, the entrance to that song, the beginning to that song, the harp before the big orchestral before Radigan's theme starts. I think that is supposed to be a hint about Merica and Radigan, the kindness of gold without order. Merica was the kindness of gold that was blended into order. Radigan was that order. She split off those aspects that she didn't want and she put them into her children, she put it into Radigan, she put them into living beings because they were parts of her. And I think that is what happened here. And I think that was why Merrick was so fractured at the end. I don't think Merrick could, could truly ever return to what she really was. I don't think that was possible for her. But I think this statue right here that we see is essentially Merrick and Radigan being blended. That is at least what I believe it is supposed to represent. And we always wondered, why is, why is Radigan Merica? How, how can two beings exist in the same vessel? Is Radigan a mimic tear? Did Merica pretend to be Radigan and she dress up like Radigan? No, I think, I think Radigan was a living being that was blended with her. And it's possible that when Merica hid away the snake aspect of herself in Baby Mesmer. She might have also split off Radigan at that point as well. And that's why Radigan isn't mentioned until the First Leonian War. She split off the fire giant aspect, the smithing, the misbegotten aspect of herself. And one by one, all of her children had all of these features and characteristics that were blended into her that she didn't want. And as for that line in the story trailer about the seduction and how this references to the one strumpet accusations, this makes me wonder if the seduction may have possibly been of Godfrey Horalu. And maybe Merica was the one that sought him out. And she recognized in him this ferocious zeal for bloodlust. She maybe she saw within him the figure that could lead her armies, that could get her where she needed to be in accordance of her goals. The same way that Mikla saw within Radon a strong consort. And the parallels between Radon and Godfrey are very strong. They were established in the base game, but also just the way that Radon really idolizes Godfrey, taking upon his same image of the lion and lions are very very esteemed and important and divine in horn scent culture they are all over inner elim all of these statues of lions with omen horns the divine beast has the visage of a lion and godfrey is assigned sarosh this lion this king this lion king to satiate this bloodlust to keep it in check and so i think what may be the case here. Godfrey Horlu might have been a Highland warrior. He might have just been a resident in the vicinity of this area, close to the Hornscent occupations. And Merica might have sought him out. He may have not been appropriate for her. He may have not been a good pick for the the chosen Empyrean saint that the Hornscent created. And maybe that is what the 
Empyrean Grandam's comments are about the the strumpet. How dare she seduce this this savage man who would end up bringing havoc upon us? Because this scene in the story trailer with all of this this blood and this destruction, all of this violence that we see, I don't think that Merica had that within her to carry out on her own. I think she had help. And who do we know that bathes himself in blood, who relishes in violence? That's Godfrey. This scene right here, this seems like something Godfrey would be capable of doing. And so with the whole distinction between Horalu and Godfrey, Godfrey even seems like this is a horn scent makeover. He has braids in his hair. He has this lion attached to him. This is maybe how they made him respectable. Okay, America, if you want to marry Godfrey, if he's going to be your lord, let's make him respectable. And that's how Horalu got his makeover. I've always thought that Merica and Godfrey had really strong Samson and Delilah vibes. And Samson was a biblical figure. He was a Nazarite that was granted unbound strength by God. But he made a vow. You will have strength as long as you never cut your hair. And Delilah was a woman from a group of people that Samson was not supposed to marry. And she ended up kind of seducing him and tricking him into cutting his hair, which was the downfall of her people. It was also what led to Samson's death. I just get Samson and Delilah vibes from America and Godfrey. I always have. Even the first beast that Samson kills is a lion. He kind of pulls it apart and might be a reference to Godfrey pulling apart Sarosh. And the whole idea about Horalu being made over to be this respectable lord, worthy of marrying this goddess, really makes me wonder if that was the seduction and then the betrayal was of the horn scent that they both participated in. And maybe Merica made about a vow to, to Horalu, if you marry me, if you become my consort and you help me get revenge on what was done to my people, I will make you my lord. You are going to be the template for the mightiest warriors, the tarnished. We are going to fill the earth, you and I, if you make this vow to me, if you promise to follow me. The horn sent Grandam curses Merica in some of her dialogue. She says, a curse upon the strumpet's progeny, upon Merica's children, each and all. The curse of the omen shall strike thee down in the form of the sacred beast's ire. And then you see Merica and Godfrey's children, Moog and Margit. And you have to wonder, huh, is that the curse of the omen that the Imperian Grandam was talking about? which would now link Merica and Godfrey to this catastrophic event at the Divine Gate. And you see all of these horn scent that have been melded together, and it doesn't seem that this was of their own will. It's kind of giving Pompeii vibes. I can absolutely get behind the idea that Merica made a vow to Godfrey. She seduced him. Thus, the comment about the strumpet, the wantonness of America using her feminine guile to get Godfrey into carrying this out for her and them both betraying the horn scent. And to me, this scene at the divine gate seems like such a targeted attack on the horn scent. This is screaming, I'm going to do to you what you did to my people. How does it feel to be whipped up and braided together and blended together? This is one big amalgamation of just horn scents that were collected and merged into something, something that America needed. And if you look up, up at the top, you actually see braids and they sort of look like the same material and shape as what is blending the two figures together. And I really wonder if that is exactly what we are seeing here is just a repeat of what the horn scent did to the shaman and did to so many other they did it to their own people as well this just seems like a very specific and targeted revenge 
I noticed in this image from the digital art book that it looks like the sap from the shadow tree was meant to be collected in this massive bowl here. And this location on the map is called the shadow tree chalice. And if you take a few steps back, it seems like this massive ceremonial wall is sculpted like a bull as well, as if it's meant to be viewed from a distance to give the illusion of this sap being poured into this communion vessel. But this bowl is bone dry, there is no sap to be found here, and I wonder if this is a hint about why the Age of Plenty stopped so suddenly. If the holy blessings stopped flowing from one tree, the same would have happened to the other tree. I think there is a lot here to think about. I could go on, but I want to just go ahead and wrap this up. And I'd love to hear your feedback on this. I know this is a very long, lengthy discussion, but as this clicked into place for me, I just got so excited about sharing it that I, I just wanted to be able to get it out there. So I'd love to know what your, your thoughts are, your feedback. And tell me if this makes sense, because it makes a lot of sense to me. It does open up a lot of other questions, but I kind of feel like we're getting a little closer. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for watching. Thank you to my channel members for your support, as always, for my, my videos. And I will see you all next time. Bye.